Hey everyone, welcome to the Tom's Hardware Podcast for December 22nd, 2020. Uh, as always, I'm Tom's Hardware Editor in Chief, Avram Pelch, and I'm joined today, by, as always, by uh, Associate Editor Les Pounder, uh, Raspberry Pi expert Ash Puckett, and special guest Ryder Damon. Hey everyone. Hey, hey, Ryder. So Ryder has a really special project that's very timely for this uh, holiday season. Uh, tell us, uh, first of all, how did, um, what do you do and how did you get started with Raspberry Pi? Sure. Um, so it's kind of a weird journey for sure, but um, I am a software engineer. Um, wasn't, didn't go to school for it or anything. I uh, went to school for biomedical engineering and then found my way into software. Uh, and while I was in school, I was doing a lot of work with Arduinos and a little bit with Raspberry Pis. And I kind of set it aside for a while, but when the pandemic hit, I got back into it quite a lot. Uh, started building projects and um, letting the internet control various things in my house and various weird projects. Like I made a machine that let the internet churn butter by pushing a button. Uh, that was a lot of fun. Um, That's cool. and yeah, it's, it was it was it was a we, a very weird project, but I loved it. Oh, um, that was delicious in the end. It was the the butter was actually very good. I was very surprised. <laughs> a few flies got in it, but I just had to pick around them. Just pick those up. Yeah. Um, and um, this is my most recent project, um, which was just letting my neighbors control my Christmas lights. Wow. So so how does it work? Um, so, uh, I can show you a little bit, like, uh, what would you like to see? So how do we, uh, how do we get it to, how, how does it connect to your Raspberry Pi and how do, how would people connect to it? Sure. Um, so it's actually, uh, in like a, a two-step architecture. So I have a Flask server that's in the cloud. Um, and that's just for my own security and because it's just easier to automate. So I keep that server in the cloud and people interact with that server and it keeps a central state of what the lights should be. Uh, and then I have the Raspberry Pi, which pings the Flask server in the cloud every like one second or so, and then updates the lights according to what the, the server in the cloud says. Awesome. So how did you connect? How many lights are there and how did you connect them to be automated? Sure. Um, I think there are about, I can share my screen if you want. I have a couple photos if you want to see. Yeah. Um, let me, let me do that. Um, okay, cool. So, um, so I have the Raspberry Pi that's in my basement right here. Um, and it's connected just through GPIO pins to, um, both a power supply and to the lights outside. Um, so the lights are, I think, WS2811 uh, LEDs, and they're 12 volts, um, which I found worked a lot better than the 5-volt ones. Uh, so I have this power supply here, and essentially it's just um, a Python library that lets me control these individually addressable LEDs and set RGB values on them. Um, so actually pretty, pretty simple overall. A uh, few bugs to work out. It only works on certain, the library only works on certain pins. And I spent all this time, I was trying to connect a top and a bottom strand independently. And I spent all the time setting it up and only to Google and it says it's not possible. Uh, so I had to go back and rip everything out. But um, but yeah, it's uh, it's it's a relatively simple project. I, I probably got it done in about two days. That's so cool. That didn't take long at all. No, um, and actually it was um, because I had already experienced with these LEDs. So I got a grant to put in an art installation in my home city. Um, so a window art installation. So using the same LEDs and everything. And do I have a photo of it? Yes, uh, hold on. Let me think this. So I was building this art installation just like this. So there are just a bunch of hanging LEDs, but you interact with them through uh, the Raspberry Pi camera, which is just over here somewhere. Um, the skeleton so, has nothing to do with it. Sorry? 
Does the skeleton have anything to do with it? Or is no, he just hanging no out? the skeleton has nothing to do with it. It was another project where I let people control it like a marionette. Uh, he just oh, sits wow. in the <laughs> Was that for Halloween? Um, no, I, I promised a bunch of people that I, if I hit a certain subscriber goal, I would do it. And then I hit it much quicker than I thought. And then I had to do it. I was never, <laughs> so I only got, I, it was coincidentally around Halloween when I finally stopped procrastinating and got around to doing it. Um, but it's the, uh, the LEDs you can control. So they're in a window front right now. So you can walk in front of them and move in front of them and you can paint with your hands on them. So I spent so much time getting all of this to work that I figured I may as well just buy some more LEDs, take the existing code, modify it a little bit and throw them on my house. And that's kind of how this project came to be. That is really neat. Yeah. Do you have, are you gonna post any videos of like the, the art installation that you're setting up for the city? Yes, um, that should be within the next couple of days. I have to carve out some time to edit it all together. It takes way more work than you would expect. Um, so these are the lights on my house, uh, and this is kind of how you interact with them. So you go to the website and you can paint essentially whatever you want, or you can choose a special effect and it will do all of this. Um, and it's, uh, let me see if I have it up. Yeah, here we go. So for anyone interested in doing this themselves at home, uh, this is just an HTML canvas down here. Uh, and I just kind of paint this little bit. And as soon as I let go of my mouse there, it sent an Ajax request back to the server. And actually, I think we can see it if we open it up. Uh, yeah. So if we watch this closely, we'll be able to see some more requests go through. So it's just sending a request to the server with the values of what it should be. And then the server updates the state accordingly. So right now, because the lights are actually on, uh, these colors are being painted on the front of my house. Wow. So can anybody log into this or do you need a special password? No special password. I, I haven't publicly shared the URL, but I guess it's out there now. Um, so feel free to go to it if you want to. Um, yeah, I, um, I threw it up in my town paper and I said anyone who wants to drive by can go to this website and kind of play wow. with the lights. That's, that's cool. So what happens if there are multiple people having it open at the same time and different uh, browsers? Like, how does it prioritize? Uh, it doesn't. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I just didn't code it to do that. I didn't want to spend too much time on it. It's definitely a problem we could solve, but I, I, I was just lazy for this one. All right. So you could have dueling, uh, dueling lights. Uh, we could, and we have at several points. Actually, when I was first setting up this website, I um, gave it a DNS entry on kind of my main website. And it turns out that someone in Oregon, I checked the logs, had already found it through like Sublister or some other tool and was just messing with me. So I was sitting in my room for about two hours trying to figure out why the lights were just randomly changing color. Cause so I was like, what have I done? Like, cause the voltage <laughs> problem, but it was just someone messing with me. That is the best. Yeah. That's the uh, best bug you could find. <laughs> yeah. So what do your neighbors think? Uh, they love it. Uh, we actually sent the link to them first, and um, they were just standing in their windows, coloring in the house. And um, I tried to keep all the special effects, like the flashing ones, to a minimum, just to <laughs> not bother them too much. But um, they think it's great. That's At least good. so much as they told me. Wow, that's really cool. I love that you were able to create like a really, I guess, realistic drawing of your house. Um, oh yeah, uh, it's actually um, in Adobe Illustrator. A long time ago, before I was a software engineer, I did a little bit of graphic design, so I just whip something up very quickly. Yeah, the interface that you have looks good. And you said that was a Flask server that it's running on. Yes, this is. That looks, that looks good. We were playing with um, me and my fiance were playing with uh, a Flask server this weekend, trying to turn an LED on and off. And like you were talking about, we had two different browsers, and we were trying to compete to see. Who would take priority trying to turn it on and off? <laughs> at this house, we're all about Flask. My eight-year-old loves Flask uh, because, like, we've used it to like control some of his robot cars. So every time we talk about doing something with another robot or whatever, he's like, "Oh, oh, we can just make a Flask page to do it now." So <laughs> that's so easy. 
so that's 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 his thing. He like he wants to do fl- a flask for everything. We've got like we've got a huge uh, agenda for the next like couple of weeks when he's off of school and I have uh, less hours of work to like build just a crazy amount of stuff. He got a bunch of different like robots as presents and things like that that are Raspberry Pi powered. And he's like, you know, keeps talking about like, yeah, I want to control this from my tablet or control this from my phone. And, you know, the first thing I say to him, I'm like, oh, I don't know if we could create an app that's too bad. He's like, no, we got to, you know, we'll just use Flask and go to, go to a web page. So, you know, it's... Uh, All of your projects have that extra layer attached to them now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, he, every, that's his answer for everything. It's like, don't worry, we can just cur- control it with Flask. So, <laughs> um, yeah, Flask is, uh, Flask is really good. A gr- great tool, um, you know, anybody in the audience doesn't know quite what it is we should do less we should do a guide on flask um but you know lets you create a web page to just do and execute any python we could actually do a a versus on that because there's another uh, framework called anvil which is very similar to flask but you create everything in a web editor on the anvil website and there's an agent that runs on device that you wish to control for example a raspberry pi and it communicates to the agent remotely from this web page, and it just works really simple. Uh, we did um, a photo booth with Anvil right, way, right. Back in, way back in May. Yes, yes. But that, 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 of course, would mean that you were depending on their cloud service, though, right? Not anymore. No, they've open sourced it, so you can run it directly on the Pi, all done and dusted. Ah. It's not bad. Not not really nice. I've used it for a few projects and it's Flask is great. I've used Flask as well, but I prefer Anvil personally. So what type of, of code did you use for this writer? Is it just straight Python or, or some other things? Uh, yeah, it's straight Python. I work in it most days so I can move quickest in it. I actually originally tried to write, I can actually show you the code. Wow. I haven't published it yet, but uh, I will. Um, I originally tried to write it. That's why it says firmware. I tried to write it with for an Arduino um, and just trying to decode the JSON from like the server was just a whole ordeal. So I just gave up and used a Raspberry Pi. Um, so yeah, it's just, just basic Python. I, I have a couple functions in here. So like a rainbow cycle and like explode from the center and rainbow chase and all of this. Uh, it felt like I was doing a coding interview actually just because all of this is very cerebral, I should say. Um, but whenever, uh, I think down here, um, it just, well, true is main. Yeah, it just cycles through. Um, yeah, it just cycles through and uh, updates the lights to what they should be. And if there's a special feature, it will, like um, someone's requested them to flash, uh, it will do one of these special features. Um, what, what I, I'm just curious. I'm not sure I recognize it. What IDE are you using for that? This is Visual Studio Code, which ah, I cool. absolutely love. A great editor. Fan, fantastic. And we do ha- actually have a tutorial on how to on how to set up Visual Studio Code uh, on our site uh, for your Raspberry Pi. So that's that's definitely really good. I have I've been meaning to set that up for my son because yeah, we we don't have the best methods. And editing stuff on the Pi, and it can be slow, or doing it over the network, uh, you could definitely do a lot better. And that's that's fantastic. Such a uh, set, such a a great timely holiday thing. Are there any other projects that you're working on these days? Um, a couple, yeah. Um, so have you seen the? I, I have a few that I need to do. Um, so uh, I'm a pilot. Uh, and one of my interests is tracking planes, and um, planes have ADS-B transmitters, so they transmit their GPS location and altitude just openly to whoever's listening. Uh, so I have an ADS-B receiver, and I connected it to a projector, and I project the real-time location of all planes above my house that are on my ceiling. Um, I'm working on that right now. Uh, and then has anyone seen the TV show Westworld by any chance? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, have you seen the new season? Uh, season three. Uh, 
I got like a part way through. I still have to, to finish it. Are you making are you making a a host? <laughs> I wish. Um, no, uh, in the new season, I'm not giving anything away. Don't worry. There's a character who has a T-shirt, uh, and it has kind of like a crossword puzzle um, that says his current mood. So like angry, surprised, upset, things like that. And it glows based on his current mood. So I'm building, um, it's a Raspberry Pi on a hat connected to the Pi camera. Uh, and it uses facial recognition to detect my current mood and then illuminates the shirt. I've been working on that one for months. I just have to find the time to complete it. That is really fun. Have you That's played cool. too much of recognition before though? Uh, a little bit, uh, but it, it's mostly easy to do. There are a lot of tutorials. You just grab something and-, and Tube it and jump in. <laughs> well, actually the original, the project that I was doing where you can draw with your hands on the screen um, that I was just talking about, Originally, I made it a facial recognition um, project, and then I realized everyone's wearing masks, so it's not going to work. So, is it's going to have a camera that points at your face somehow yeah. on your hat? You're going to wear a hat, and then it's going to like get a get a look at your face. Pretty much, yeah. I have a wide angle lens. It's not great. It thinks I'm upset most of the time, and I'm <laughs> not wrong. Um, so yeah. it's just, um, yeah, it's um, it, it's a pretty cool project. I do need, so I'm doing this one on a Pi 3B+, plus, but I need one of the newer Pis to run it properly. Otherwise, it doesn't process the model fast enough. Yeah, no no, no question. We were we had uh, Lady Ada from, from Ada Fruit, Ada Fruit on uh, the other day, and she was talking about how now that we have Pi 4 is the minimum that you need to do uh, to do image recognition, to do um, to do AI, and then of course there um, there's you could attach the Google Coral uh, USB or uh, Adafruit is coming out with their own uh, CPU accelerator board at some point, so you could get even better better speeds. Although I think probably just the regular Pi Four would probably be fast enough. But yeah, that that sounds really cool. So, uh, so speaking of things that are really cool, Ash, you have something that something on Pi that's going to tell us about the future. Yeah. So I was cleaning my house this weekend, and I came across my old Raspberry Pi fortune teller project. This is this is one that I actually already created a how to guide for on. Uh, another website I write for, How To, and if you look up Raspberry Pi fortune teller on Google, it's one of the top results. But here it is. It's shaped like a little takeout box, complete with a metal wire. I've got an arcade button on the side, and when you press the button, it's not plugged in right now, but when it is, and it has a pie inside, and you press the button, the printer here prints out your fortune. Now, I wanted to take it apart and show you guys what's inside because I have a video demo of it working, so I don't really need all the guts working. But here's the printer, and it connects using to the GPIO with these two wires. It gets power here through this adapter. I think I just used a five volt, two amp power supply, and this adapter, it connects with just a little 2.1 millimeter jack. Here, get that plug back in. And inside, I've got just a standard arcade button that connects to the GPIO, and there's a little shelf that will you can rest your Raspberry Pi inside on. So I'm gonna switch my screen over here to give a demo of what it looks like in action. I think it's really fun. Can you guys see the YouTube video okay? Yep. All right. Yep. Hit the button, and it prints your fortune. And it's a little uh, thermal printer, so. Nice. I mean, I'm using it to print a fortune, but you could you could do almost anything with it. One idea that I had was um, I haven't done this yet, but I want to get a Raspberry Pi camera and basically make like the old um, Game Boy. If you if you had like the old Game Boy Color, they had a yeah. cartridge with the camera, and you could just print it off on the receipt, like your picture. That would be pretty fun. But what what yeah. about you guys? Have you guys um, have you used the thermal printer before, or have you seen it used in a project? What do you think about it? I think that's amazing. Yeah. I love I love this idea. I have to think of. I know my son would get an absolute kick out of it. Like a lot of just like a lot of things that I would do the pie. I can't think of like a practical use of having a thermal printer. But I I mean unless I was running a store and I was using it to print receipts or something. But 
I, I can think of many fun impractical uses of it. <laughs> practical uh, uses are good. <laughs> yeah, like if, like telling the fortune, or like you did, or doing doing Laura's pictures. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's pretty neat, uh, per particularly when you. Oh, someone says an oracle pie. Yeah, I saw that comment. <laughs> yes, yes. Well. So, oh, I should mention the code is on GitHub. I, I made it in Python, and if you want, you can download it and just plug in your own fortune. So if you want to make up a bunch of nonsense to, you know, make your family laugh this holiday, that's probably a good way to go about it. Did you write all the fortunes yourself? Yeah, they say fortune one and fortune two because I was just testing, and I didn't really come up with any actual oh, fortunes. Oh, see, <laughs> so that, yeah, they're all up in here. Yeah, that's what you've got to. That's what you got to do. You got to coming up with the fortunes is the real challenge. That's the fun part. And then having like a big list of them. And then you have to come up with how are they going to be randomly picked? Because you don't want to get the same one all the time. I don't know. A lot of things to consider. What if you built AI into it? If you use the camera combined with what Ryder's talking about with mood recognition and gave you a fortune based on your mood. That's a fun idea. You could cheer people up or ruin their day. Yeah. <laughs> yes. That would be a... Uh... So that would be funny. Or you could also, I guess, program it to be like a magic eight ball. Yeah. No. The, maybe. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, there's a lot of paper things one one could do one could do with this. I mean, the other the other thing you could do is I don't know how many old sci-fi shows did this, but there were a bunch of old sci-fi shows where people had computers, and rather than having a, a screen, they would get like a little printout of what the computer was trying to say. So you could yeah. probably make like a really cool prop with that. Like, I don't know, I, I'm really dating myself here, but, you know, I really got into watching Space 1999 and they would have like a, a thing on the show where they use the computer and they didn't have a screen. They'd be like, oh, tell us, are we going to hit the moon? And they'd like get a little slip like that and be like, oh, 99% probability. <laughs> probably make some really neat like old time computer props uh, that, that, print, that print things out with that printer. Uh, I love so, that idea. <laughs> so speaking of things that are not so old time, uh, Les has some uh, some really cool new stuff that he's been playing with from Pimeroni. Indeed. Hello. Yes, I've been messing around today. Excuse me a second. My studio is just falling apart as I speak. Um, with Pimeroni's new Breakout Garden um, boards. So these are boards that connect into the Breakout Garden hat. I'll just show you on your camera here. Now, can you see that okay? It looks good. It, it looks... Oh, hang on. That is it catching up with me? Mm -hmm. Because I can't see a thing. Okay, I'm going to go blind on this. If you can't see anything, let me know. Um, so the Breakout Garden hat it fits on top of a Raspberry Pi with a 40-pin GPIO, and it has these breakout cards that fit in the top. And with these cards, I can put anything I want in. So right now, I've got a potentiometer on the right-hand side, and on the left, I've got a rotary encoder. Both look identical, but both have very different jobs. So rotary encoder will spin around, and you'll feel a, a bump when it goes around, and that indicates that you're moving the encoder around. You can go left, you can go right, and it has infinite scroll. And it's used quite often to control menus. So if you've got a, a 3D printer, like a Creality Ender, they have a, a control knob on the front. That's a rotary encoder. A potentiometer is an analog electronic device. You feed it a voltage. And as you turn a potentiometer left and right, the voltage will change and the voltage is output for a device to sense. In this case, there's a built-in microcontroller on these boards that understands exactly um, what to do with that data. It spits it out as just serial data and it tells it it's either zero volts or five volts, depending on what you're feeding it. But these ones are slightly different and I do hope you can see this because otherwise it's a bit lost, lost point. But they have RGB LEDs inside of them which I think yeah, is really we can good. see that brilliant. So I'm going to try and show you live what can happen with them. So I've got a potentiometer running now, and it's on the right hand side. If I spin it now, can you see any color change? Mm. Not yet. It's a little behind. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's neat. So the potentiometer goes to the left. That's as far as it goes. And then to the right, so now I just keep spinning this around. You'll see the data changing on the uh, terminal output. Yeah. 
And there we go. It's really nice. But the rotary encoder is a little bit different. So if I just stop this code running now and load up rotary encoder, it's the left hand side now for app. I'm going to spin this round. And the numbers will change and the color will change. He says with hope in his heart. Because right now it's just showing green. Let's spin yeah. it the other way. There you go. Red's coming through now. Right. So why would you use pick one or the other? Right. So rotary encoders are useful for well menu interfaces. So if you have one single dial to control an LCD screen, so for example, the 3D printer, you use it to select what you want to um, click on and then push a rotary encoder in, and that will do a button click. A potentiometer you would use for very fine control. So say you had a simple analog electronic circuit, for example, an LED. So there's no microcontroller or anything, just a simple potentiometer. You would vary the voltage with the resistor, the potentiometer, which would then cause the LED to dim. Now you could also apply that same logic to a motor. So you can control the motor with very fine, precise control because you're controlling the voltage to that, motor, to that motor. In this case, you would use it for controlling a strip of LED lights, for example. So RGB LEDs, you could have your NeoPixels, your WS2811s, 2812s, your APA102s, these dot stars. And you could have them lit up all around and you could mix the colors using three of these potentiometers or rotary encoders, whatever you wish, to create really interesting light effects. Now, these two devices do have their own built-in RGB LEDs. Unfortunately, they're not smart LEDs. They're not APA102s or WS2811s. They're just dumb uh, RGB LEDs. That's really what they are. They have, they've got no brains whatsoever. We just change the voltage to each of the four pins inside. We have one common pin, which is either a common anode or a common cathode. And we change the voltage to three other pins to change the mix of the color. So I've been reviewing these for the past day and they're quite good. They're very, they're very niche. Given the choose, they're very niche, but they're, they're quite fun to mess around with. And if you have to put a dial or a rotary encoder in a project, why not put some RGB on it? Everything is better with RGB. Exactly. Right? I mean, so are the lights that you use, Ryder, uh, completely RGB? Or do you, are you using, like, what what standard, are you, what standard of RGB are you using? Uh, <laughs> I don't really know the answer to that question. Um, I, it's just, they're just, um, I don't think they're RGBA. Um, yeah, it's just um, neopixel.rgb. Um, it took a little while to get to that or to figure that out because I think it was RBG before or something weird like that. Um, yeah, you got GRB and RGB, which because my Christmas tree has got two different sets of lights on. So when one set is red, the other set is green for some reason. So it's right. cool. That's right. If, you, if you're doing Christmas lights and your Christmas lights are not controlled by Raspberry Pi, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> You can't just have a regular a regular switch. So we didn't get to ask Ryder the question that we ask. We try to ask all of our guests, which is, how many Raspberry Pis do you own? <laughs> um, probably, um, probably about fifteen now. Nice. Aha. Uh -huh. yeah. uh, and probably twice as many ESP eighty two sixty sixes because I burn <laughs> them out all the time. Yes. I think the issue is you have so many, but then, you know, you have them in stuff and it's like, oh, do I want to take this out of this case, which I can't take it out of unless I ruin the case. So I guess I've got another pie. <laughs> yeah. The, the whole setup is just a whole ordeal and I, I don't want to have to go through it all again. It's I, I usually actually have kind of a centralized one that I'll use from project to project if I can. Um, and I'll just take out the SD card and put it in because then I know it's going to grab this specific IP address on my network, and then I can just automatically connect to it and don't have to change anything. Yeah, I think I think now I'm probably approaching 20, uh, 20 pies, especially the last couple of weeks where I'm getting in all of these kits that 
come with Raspberry Pi zeros. So if you count Raspberry Pi zeros, which I do, you know, so, you know, my son and I bought a whole bunch of Pimeroni kits that are some of which have come, some of which haven't. Here's one that we built last night, which is really cool, which is the, uh, the Kibo. Uh, oh, cool. So what this does, if you haven't seen it before, is you create a little mechanical keyboard. This one has 12 keys. They also make one that's three keys, but three keys, it's not a lot. Uh, it, at the bottom level of it is a Pi Zero W. And what you do is it actually, they give you the software. It's a very minimal boot. Like, I don't think it even has, is it really Raspberry Pi OS? I'm not even sure less. It's a, it's a very minimal boot of Raspberry OS. I think it's just enough to get you to, well, to a terminal, so to speak. Right. And then you can, you can, you can basically program the keys and the RGB under them to do whatever you want. So using the USB gadget mode of Raspberry Pi Zero, you can, you know, use this, you plug this into any PC and it sees it as another keyboard. And then uh, we just built it last night. Building it only takes like 15 minutes. And, and then we're going to, you know, we're going to decide like what to assign the keys to. We're already having kind of an argument over who gets to play with it. He's like, I need this for school. I got to sign macros for school. And I was like, yeah, but I need it for work. Uh, but, you know, you, you could see the, the endless possibilities of like assigning this to do, to do different things, on, to do different things. And it's all based on Pi. They make two versions of it, one with uh, clicky keys and one with quiet keys. But I would never get something with quiet keys. <laughs> Although I suppose, all day. although I suppose you could, I suppose you could buy either one and then put your own switches in, probably because I think these are standard, uh, standard MX style switches. So, yeah. um, anyway, uh, that's that's all the time we have for today's episode. But I wanted to especially thank Ryder Damon for coming on and sharing his awesome uh, Christmas light project with us and telling us about some of his other projects. The best way to find out what you're doing is to go to your website, right? Which is uh, riderdamon.com? Uh, no, um, that one you won't find anything. Uh, ridercomdown.com, or if you just Google Rider Calm Down, you'll find me. Rider Calm Down, awesome. Uh, uh, thanks as always to Ash and Les and to all of you who, who listen and watch. Uh, we will be back. We will be back again next Tuesday, as always, at 2.30 p.m. Eastern. 7 30 p.m british time uh, and you can find us in between uh via as audio wherever podcasts are distributed and on youtube and facebook see you later